you know, I would never have, never have actually guessed that I was going to be a vegetable farmer. I think we just have a, a beautiful life. We work really hard, but we have this diverse farming job. This is The Producers. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Inspired by farmers' markets while working as scientists in the U.S., Stan and Bryony Robert of Fat Carrot Farm started forming a greater connection to the food that fueled their bodies. It led to a yearning to grow their own vegetables, and now they have an organic vegetable farm that supplies some of Hobart's best restaurants. Fat Carrot Farm is run by my wife Bryony and I. We are in uh, southeast of Tasmania. We're about 30 minutes south of Hobart. We're pretty close to the coast in Oyster Cove, uh, which is near to Bruni Island. Um, it's got a really mild climate that's, I guess, moderated by being near the coast. So it never gets really hot here and it, we don't get really cold either like some other parts of Tassie do. So uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, we're very privileged to live here and uh, well, also – you know, bear in mind always that this is unceded land that we are living and thriving on. So that's always in the back of our mind. A lot of what we like to eat uh, and then grow comes from, you know, cl- climates that are temperate or, you know, maybe not quite temperate, but uh, close enough that that the climate here works. So because of our mostly frost-free uh, status. We can grow things like avocados here and citrus, which people might not expect that we can do in Tassie, but then we can grow a lot of the things that um, you would expect to find in our kind of climate zone in Europe, so northern Italy, uh, sort of central France. Um, most of that stuff will grow happily here, and that's what we, we do. We grow things from sort of similar climatic zones uh, in other parts of the world. Inspired by farmers' markets in the US, Stan bought land in southern Tasmania and they both put their hands in the soil. My wife and I, we met, we were both scientists, so we met while we were PhD students uh, studying genetics. And on a very early holiday on Kangaroo Island in South Australia, we just both said to each other, oh, we've got to live in the country. We're going to live in the country one day. We just knew it was going to happen, but it was hard to work out how that would happen in scientists because mostly as scientists, you live near a big city where there are universities or research institutions. But that was a, a thought that was parked in the back of our heads. But if we fast forward a while, we were living in the U.S., in Seattle. I was working at the University of Washington, we lived across the road from a farmer's market, which was our first introduction to farmer's markets. They didn't really exist here in Australia back then, which is in the late 90s. And um, met some small farmers, you know, pieces of the puzzle were sort of locking into each other in, in our heads. And, and then we had the thought that we wanted to move back to Australia. We didn't want to move back to Adelaide, you know, our families were there. So... Uh, we, t- we took advice from a good friend and, and looked for work in Tassie, uh, came here and worked and then started the search for land. And that search for land was, uh, was always going to happen. But we didn't know what kind of farm we were going to run. You know, we, we still had that old school Australian concept of farming that a farm has to be big. You grow one or two things. So obviously that didn't happen. We kind of just gradually evolved into Fat Carrot Farm, um, which is, yeah, sounds a bit weird uh, for people who are thinking or planning to be farmers. Uh, While we were still thinking, what crop are we going to grow? You know, we just, we built our own house. We uh, built our vegetable garden and orchard from scratch on an old cow paddock that we bought. And um, sort of it just grew from there. We realized that we were growing the things that we loved, uh, the things that we had a connection to from all of our travel and eating history. And um, it just kind of expanded. And then we accidentally were market gardeners one day. 
When establishing the garden, Stan looked at the sort of produce other countries with similar climate and soil to Oyster Cove grew. Well, the, the earliest parts establishing the garden were while we still had young children in tow. Our kids have grown up and have left home now. Um, we were building a house, working as scientists and setting up a market garden, um, which sounds all a bit crazy now. And in retrospect, I'm not sure where we found the energy to do that. But um, we do like working hard uh, and keeping our brains and bodies uh, active. So that was tough. That was definitely tough. And um, it, it was hard to do it on a, on a bit of a budget too. So we, we were pretty financially conservative. We, we never took, you know, borrowed money to, to do the farm. We kind of just scrimped and saved and then, you know, bought some fencing material and saved again and bought a few hand tools and it kept going like that. So, which I think is a great model if you can do it. It means you can't get into business quickly, but it also means that we, you know, we had a business running and making an income and we didn't have any debt. Uh, which was, which is a kind of low stress situation to be in. Stan's love of food stems from his parents cutting his teeth in commercial kitchens and learning to grow vegetables in his parents' back garden. Well, fruit trees, uh, we never really anticipated that it'd be part of our production that we would sell. So uh, I've just always had an interest in everything growing. I was a member of the Rare Fruit Society when I was in Adelaide and I was interested in growing lots of different uh, heirloom fruit and nut trees. So the plan was just to have a you know an amazing orchard here that would give us fruit and nuts throughout the year pretty much. And so that was the that's what we did with the fruit trees and we started planting them when we started building the house. Uh, I, some a friend of ours when we lived in America said, "Oh, there's an old English saying that says you need to plant your orchard before you're 40." And uh, but I think she actually actually may have said before you're 30. So I stressed out. We moved to Tassie, you know, when I I think I was just before 30, and I just I got to plant all my fruit trees. <laughs> so um, I started planting fruit trees while we were building vegetables. So I've always been into cooking. Um, I grew up uh, with food around. Uh, my family, we're from Singapore. My parents ran a restaurant when I was born. Uh, so some of my earliest memories are uh, being in a restaurant kitchen, uh, watching my dad bring the market produce in and then my mum and my auntie cook. Um, so there that, that are memories that, you know, they're just still there. We grew up in a house that was always uh, everything revolved around food. Um, we moved to Australia, and you know, I just sat in the kitchen and watched my mum cook, and she let me help from early on. I was cooking with her since I was probably five. Um, so all of the all of the time growing up, when I started travelling, it was. Food was just there in the front of my mind. Um, I never really thought I'd be a chef uh, because being the son of immigrants, I, you know, I was kind of expected to be pr- professional like an engineer or a doctor or something. But all of my part-time jobs uh, from when I was about 15 were all cooking. Um, so I, I just worked my way up in kitchens uh, from really – crappy places to some really good ones by the end of when I was cooking. Um, and I would say probably the most, uh, I guess, the most inspirational place, the place that suddenly made me think about food in a completely different way was when I worked at the the original Aristologist, uh, the Uradler Aristologist, run by Jennifer Hillier and Michael Simons. Uh, that, that was in the... 80s and they closed in the early 90s. Ah, that that was such an eye opener for me. You know, that idea of food coming from locally, from the garden of the restaurant, and cooking what's in season. I'd never, I never knew about that. 
you know, none of the chefs that I worked with up, up until then worked like that. You would just design a menu and order whatever you wanted. Uh, but this, you know, there were all these, there was these funny things happening. I was eating things at the Aristologist. They just tasted so good and I just couldn't work out why they tasted so good. Jennifer made, uh, fresh egg pasta with just a pasta with a tomato sauce for lunch, for a staff lunch. And I said, Oh, Jennifer, this is amazing. What's in the sauce? And she just looked at me like I was a nut and said, tomato. And, and, uh, so all these things started, uh, clicking together in my head. So this is where the food starts from. This is where the flavor starts from is from the produce. So, um, I, I started growing stuff in the backyard when I was a teenager, which is a bit odd. None of my, neither of my parents were into gardening as such. Um, and I think, yeah, growing vegetables is a connection to all of the food that I've eaten around the world when I've traveled, places I've cooked. Uh, and so I just grow what I want to cook and eat. Basically, that's where the vegetable growing came from. Stan likes to grow little-known and rare produce and shine a light on its beauty. One that comes to mind, actually, is a, a little uh, squash called Delicata squash that's pretty well known now in Tassie, maybe in, even in other parts of Australia. We, it was something we ate in the US when we lived there. It was It's a phenomenal little pumpkin, really, with a thin skin that's edible uh, when you roast it whole. Pretty, pretty sweet, pretty... Uh, complex flavor, a bit chestnutty. Um, so we grow them and I guess we maybe, I think we were the first people maybe introduced them to the Hobart dining scene and now they're just in every nice restaurant here and lots of growers grow them. So that's a nice thing to, to share that kind of, uh, knowledge and uh, part of our history. Um, so we grow a few things like that from North America. Delicata squash tomatillos. Uh, we've been growing them for a long time since we lived in the States and ate Mexican food there on some of the farms we, uh, volunteered on over there. Uh, Mexican workers everywhere, of course, uh, running the whole agricultural industry. Well, not running it, but the backbone of it. And, um, so tomatillos, delicata squash, several peppers that we've eaten over there, pasillas, poblanos. And then peppers from Europe, you know, we grow um, padron, um, then various, I mean, it just seems too many things to list, but they've all become relatively common now in, in Australia. But when we moved to Tassie, we struggled to find the seeds and a lot of people didn't even know what we were talking about when we talked about the things that we wanted to grow here. Probably there were, you know, migrant communities who had that stuff growing in their backyards, but just wasn't part of the mainstream fruit and veg scene here. As the farm grew, they reached a point where they could entertain going commercial and needed a name. The soil's unique properties and a star performer in the soil leapt off the page. So we do have really good soil for market gardening. Uh, it's a, We're on an old alluvial pan here, so it's a, it's a alluvial silty loamy soil beautiful virtually no stones uh pretty well draining but it's also moisture retentive underneath uh carrots grow amazingly here once we worked out how to grow them properly and one of our um i guess favorite varieties of carrots to grow is an old french variety called chantenay which uh can grow quite big and and in our soil, it seems to go really big, like forearm size, if you leave it. And they, and they stay, uh, beautifully tender. And I think they taste better and better as they get bigger. Um, at that time, when we were, you know, at the point of going commercial with the farm, we were sort of thinking of all possible names and, you know, trying to think of evocative and romantic names. And my wife has got similar sense of, silly humor as me she said oh let's just call it fat carrot farm and, uh, and i was like oh but that's so lame and then it just stuck so yes um 
it is a bit it's a bit awkward in some of the places that uh cook with our produce you know they want to put on the menu where the produce comes from and it's a bit odd to say fat carrot farm beans or something it does sound a bit weird because um so at one of the places we supply Tom McHugo's it's our biggest customer and it's our favorite place to go and eat in Hobart uh, they just have refer to us on the menu now as FCF, so maybe it will eventually turn into FCF. But <laughs> when the problem of excess vegetables became a reality, it forced Stan to look for solutions. As as the garden was sort of getting bigger, we you know we were still just growing for ourselves, but I just love so much growing vegetables and cooking and eating them that. Um, we just kept expanding and we got to a point where you know, if you try to make sure you grow all your own vegetables, inevitably you'll have excess. And a friend of ours, um, Zoe Magnus, she was starting a co-op, like a vegetable and produce and dry goods co-op about 10, 15 minutes south of us in a little hamlet called Woodbridge. She said, oh, well, if you've got spare produce, we'll buy it and put it into the vegetable boxes that we will assemble from other growers. And so we just started selling that way, which was great. Um, and then we just sort of gradually transitioned into selling directly to restaurants and doing our own CSA, community-supported agriculture type boxes. After dining in a Hobart restaurant, Stan formed a relationship with a chef who has used fat carrot farm produce ever since. We've sold to a few places in Hobart and currently uh, the ones we sell to, uh, we've had pretty good long relationships with them. Um, Tom McHugo's, as I mentioned before, run by Tom Westcott uh, as the chef and Whitney Ball, who runs front of house. They're fantastic. They're local uh, food legends here in Hobart. Everyone must know them by now. Um, so I, as a person who's into food and cooking, you know, a lot of experiences I've had eating, um, the, me- the most memorable experiences for me are like the simple food, the, the farm food that I've eaten when I've traveled, the food on the street, uh, the food in people's houses. Uh, I did think that I wanted to, cook in fine dining kind of establishment before. But when I look back, I, I just can't even remember half of those meals. They sort of just blur into nothing. Whereas the most memorable meals for me are the really simple things that I've eaten, um, in, as I said, on the street. And so we often, we, we actually stopped eating out at restaurants for a while. And we went to a restaurant in Hobart though, um, it was it was a weird little place called the the pump house, I think it was called, and um, and we just thought, oh, oh, this menu looks good, so we just ordered a bunch of stuff, and it was really good food. And it was like, ah, oh, this is the best meal I've had in a restaurant for a long time, and so I introduced myself to the chef, which was young Tom Westcott, and um, we sort of kicked up a bit of a relationship there, and. Eventually, I got back in touch with him not that much later when he was head chef at Franklin and started selling produce to him. Uh, and soon after that, he told me that he was moving across the road to start Tom McHugo's with his partner, Whitney Ball. And I said, well, I'm selling my produce to you, so I'll, I'll move with you. Um, so we've been selling produce to Tom McHugo since the start of – I'm at Hugo's. We've been selling produce to Templo since the start of Templo, uh, when Matt Breen started it off. Um, and we still, he's not there anymore, but we still sell to Matt, um, at, at Sunny, the little wine bar. Um, and that's a great place to go for a snack and a glass of wine. And we also sell to Peter Cooksley at Hamlet. Uh, Peter's a great person and a really great chef and um, we started selling to him when he was the head chef of Franklin <laughs> and and then have followed him 
to uh, to Hamlet. Um, and Hamlet's such a great you, – you know about Hamlet. Uh, it's such a great social enterprise. Um, they're doing fantastic things for the community and cooking delicious food. So uh, it's it's another business that we're really happy to support. So the the four restaurants that we supply to we um they just really mesh with us on a personal level and we love the food they cook it's the food we'd eat so um makes sense for us to sell our stuff there. It's very hands on at Fat Carrot Farm from planting seed to delivery of produce. So that really varies obviously from season to season and and we're on a bit of a weekly cycle as well so um so for example on a thursday thursday is our big harvest day um because that's our delivery to hobart day so and we part of our model is that we want everything to arrive at restaurants like in absolute peak condition like as fresh as possible so we do harvest pretty much everything that we sell on Thursday morning and then deliver it by lunchtime. So there are some things we can't fit in into that window of time. Uh, so we do pick some things on the Wednesday afternoon that aren't, you know, going to be perishable. Uh, but all the greens, all the herbs, you know, even things like fennels, which I think, uh, you know, they don't keep out of the ground for as long as people think. Uh, I'd like to pick them on the Thursday morning. So Thursday morning, we wake up pretty early, uh, have a coffee, and we just we've got our list, our uh, picking list printed, and we're just out there. And my wife and I, having been together for so long, we just work together really amazingly. You know, she knows the things that she's good at picking. I know the things I'm good at picking, and we just do a lot of those picking jobs independently, but then some jobs we pick things together, we do the washing and packing all together under our big veranda of our farmhouse. Um, and um, then we take off to Hobart and do a, a run, and it's a lovely time. We get to talk to the people who are cooking our food when we deliver, and, you know, Tom Westcott comes out of the kitchen into the alleyway where we deliver, and he's always so excited to see what we've brought. They all love it. They love it, and um, and we love it. We love to talk to them and ask them what they're going to cook. And um, I think I have a bit of a reputation of um, being a you know a very critical person with food, and so there's a little bit of sometimes it's like, oh, I'm not sure whether we should tell Stan what we're going to cook for this this week. <laughs> We might not approve, but uh, yeah. mostly it's uh, it's great, and uh, and it's great to be able to. Occasionally, we deliver something that someone's ordered, and they say, "Well, what do we actually do with this? We don't know, but we just thought we'd order it." And so I spend a bit of time explaining how to cook it, which is great. Makes me feel good about myself. <laughs> Stan and his wife Bryony have built a full circle organic farm that's not only self-sustaining, but connecting with the local community too. We have other parts of the farm that aren't that aren't on the market, so to speak. Uh, we try to have a whole farm system going on here. So we have uh, free ranging poultry. Um, we've got turkeys, Muscovy ducks and chickens. And that's meat uh, that we eat. We can't sell that meat uh, based on the way the laws work here for for because we'd have to get them slaughtered at an abattoir. So we have a whole system. We have waste product that goes uh, to the animals. So all the outer leaves, uh, spoiled fruit goes through to the animals. Turkeys love apples. Like it's it's like they're on crack when they have apples, and um, so every, nothing goes to waste here. Then we eat the animals, the animal manure and everything from the animals gets used either in compost or we eat it or goes into the um, biochar kiln and the biochar goes into the compost. So we've got, finally, it feels like every piece of the this sort of loop farm system has come together after so many years and, you know, thinking back to when I read some of the books on permaculture when I was in my 
early 20s. It's just such a lovely thing to see it does all come, it can all come together um, and it can all work together. So we really love that. We, we, we do think about how fortunate we are, but um, yeah, it's a, been a lot of hard work to get to this point and it, it's great. Life on the farm has changed Stan and now he wants to give other young farmers the same opportunities. We will keep doing this for a while and hopefully, you know, it's pretty hard in hospital world, so I hope the places that we supply uh, will keep going. Um, the chefs that we work with, they're all pretty young, you know, they're all in their 30s, uh, so, you know, chefs, I know chefs burn out, but um, I'd hope to work with the people that we're working with now for a few years. We are outside of the market garden on our property, which is uh, not big, but it's it's bigger than the market garden. We are trying to regenerate the land here. So we've got plantings of natives um, to attract birds and insects um, and increase the diversity. We're managing our pastures in a different way. We, we're not big enough to have uh, grazing animals like cows or sheep really here to to do that, but we are doing it with turkeys. We are regenerating the grasslands here with turkeys, and that's working really well. Um, we would like to grow vegetables forever, I would say, uh, because I always want to eat vegetables and, and we'll always want to eat our meat. Um, but I guess we will get to a point where the work will get a bit too hard for us physically. Uh, I'm not sure when that will be, and we will start to scale back the market garden. But there is another possibility that Bryony and I have spoken about, and that is to um, take on a young farmer or a farming couple and transition to them running it. Um, because one thing we were fortunate with back in the 90s, buying land here in Tassie, it was, you know, they could barely sell land. It was so cheap. And now there's a there's a big obstacle to um, young farmers wanting to get into the game is just the inability to buy land. And so if we can help some young farmers um, to get into farming, that would be good. We we sort of do that already. We have volunteers who come who want to learn. We've helped a few young farmers start off their own places already. Um, but I think it's just getting harder and harder for people to acquire land. So if we can somehow pass the farm on without actually leaving here, uh, pass it on as a working enterprise to some young farmers, that that would be something we'd like to work towards. The move from scientist to living the dream on the land has completely changed Stan's life. You know, I would never have, never have actually guessed that I was going to be a vegetable farmer. You know, even back 20 plus years ago when we thought we would farm and um, yeah, it's just changed in life we, to an amazing degree. We, I think we just have a, a beautiful life. We work really hard, but we have this diverse farming job. Uh, we're both full-time on the farm. You know, it's enough to pay for us to live, uh, you know, growing vegetables on just over 2,000 square metres, very intensively. Um, we've, we, because we grow so many things, uh, and we're both scientists by training. We just have this kind of passion for working out how to grow each crop optimally, how to grow everything so it's healthy and it tastes amazing, um, and also how to look after the soil. Like that's the environmental considerations on our farm are maybe even more important to us than the taste. And so we are trying our best to improve soil health every season and to and to regenerate other parts of our property, planting trees. This was just a barren paddock before. So it gives us a – being vegetable farmers gives us a, a real intellectual uh, challenge. It does. It sounds a bit of a funny thing to say. Um, it, 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 we've got a lot of complex stuff going on at once. We're growing so many different crops that have different requirements, that have – uh, different uh, growth periods and 
getting that right for every crop. And, you know, we're still learning a lot, but each year we're sort of nailing a new crop. Um, and it's really uh, satisfying uh, intellectually and physically um, for us, the kind of work that we do. We've kept it mostly all manual uh, and we both uh, like working hard with our bodies. And so I think it's kept us physically healthy, good for our mental health and um, and we just get to eat the best produce around, I reckon. Fat Carrot Farm is a wonderful example of not only self-sustaining farming, but finding a greater connection in the community and the restaurant sector too. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of producers, farmers, makers and growers, the true lifeblood of the food industry. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or email us at producerspodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au.